I hope you're doing well today. Oh, yeah, we're live. Sweet, awesome. Hey, guys, uh, welcome to uh, chapel number three, I think this is for you guys, on Revelation. So I uh, hope you've had a good couple of weeks. Um, hope y'all been doing well. Um, today we're going to be diving into a little bit more of the book of Revelation, and I got some questions that uh, Mr. McKay gave us, uh, gave me, and so, this is funny. Uh, I love the questions y'all y'all came up with. So, uh, can we analyze Revelation more? For example, what is the mark of the beast? Um, what is the difference between Hades, death, and Satan in Revelation? Okay, what happens to Christians on earth during the during the rapture? What is the best way to understand what God expects of me? And we're going to learn more about the method you shared for studying Scripture. So super easy softball questions, right? Like we'll be done in 10 minutes uh, today. LOL, JK, no way. Um, so but I'm excited. Um, we're going to break this up into two weeks. Um, and so we're going to look at some questions today and then do some next week just because I want to give enough time um, to each of these questions to answer them well. And to not just give you like a super cliche answer that doesn't help you. Um, I actually want you like to understand um, what's going on. And so um, the first thing we're going to dive into is the mark of the beast question uh, in just a second. Um, but before we get there, uh, I thought it was important too. you got to have a timeline. I mean, I mean, if you're going to study Revelation and not have a timeline. You got to have a timeline. Right. And so here's my potential timeline. I'm going to walk you through. Um, all right. So. Side note, let me insert this. Um, when it comes to the sequence of events and like the timeline of things in Revelation, like that's what everyone wants to know and understand. Like, when is this going to happen? But here's the thing, y'all. Unfortunately, the Bible does not give us an exact date or itinerary for these sequence of events. It tells us these things are going to happen, uh, but when they're going to happen, um, is not that clear. And so when it comes to like this timeline, you got to have an open hand with these things. We can speculate and say, you know, I think to my understanding, this is when this might happen. But you, you really can't give a hard for sure on some of these things. Uh, now we can say, yes, for sure, Jesus is coming again. Like that's super clear. We can say yes. But when can't really say. Um, it says in Matthew that no one knows the hour but the Father, right? And so all that to say, as we kind of walk through this, this is not like definite, like this is exactly how it's going to happen. But to my understanding, when I read the Bible, that that's what I get out of it. Um, but that's not something that I'm going to be a hard and fast on. Like, you have to believe this. Like, we can disagree on the exact order of some of these things and still be Christians. And so just needed to insert that. All right, make sure we're on the same page. So with that in mind, um, there's going to be the rapture of the church, uh, which was a question we'll come back to. Um, so Christians will be raptured, will be in heaven with God. Um, and then the Antichrist will come. Um, the Antichrist is someone who is against Jesus, who is leading people astray, uh, causing people to blaspheme God and so on. And with that is the false prophet and mark of the beast. And so we're going to be coming back to this in a minute. Then there is the tribulation. Um, battle of Gog and Magog, Abomination, Desolation, Battle of Armageddon, Judgment Nations, Binding of Satan, the Millennial Kingdom, Last Battle, Great White Throne, and New Creation. Essentially, if you just go through the book of Revelation and look at the subtitles, if you, know, if you have a decent Bible, you'll get an idea, uh, a, a general idea of kind of what's going on. Um, but I, I marked a couple of things, a little asterisk beside Rapture, Tribulation, the Millennial Kingdom, um, because those are, are three of the main areas that you're going to have some disagreement on as to when and, and how uh, you know those things are going to take place. Um, and so you probably, if you've been in church for a while or um, y'all are a Christian school, I mean, I mean I'm, I've never been in a Christian school, but I'm guessing you this has come up somewhere somehow, maybe not, um, but like terms like pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, uh, pre-millennial, post-millennial, like all these different things, amillennial. And so like there's these different theological positions when it comes to like some of the order of events. For example, um, pre-millennial kind of refers to that the tribulation is going to take place before the millennial kingdom. So on my timeline, the way I understand scripture the tribulation will happen first before the, the millennial kingdom. 
Um, but there's some people who are, they're post-millennial, so they think that the tribulation is going to happen afterwards. Um, and so, and that's fine. I mean, that's just the way they read scripture. Uh, but just so you know, like those are some of the main things. Um, like the rapture, um, will, will the church be raptured before the tribulation? So it's a pre-trib. Or will the church be raptured after the tribulation, post-tribulation? Um, and so, once again, all those things, like n- no one can say 100% for sure, post, pre, mid, ah, whatever, is only to the best of our understanding. And we don't get weighted down by those particulars. We study, we learn, we want to figure out. But at the end of the day, the main point of all this is not the post or the pre, the before or the after. Like, that's not the main point. The main point is that right here, God's Jesus is coming again and he's going to restore his creation. Like that's the main point, right? And so as you study and as we get into this, Let's not get super weighed down by all these particulars and like get super frustrated. We want to study and understand as best we can, um, but we do so kind of with them with an open hand. So with that, Mark of the Beast, let's talk about that bad boy. So uh, Revelation 13, if you have a Bible, go to Revelation 13. That's where we're going to be. That's where the Mark of the Beast is talked about. Um, so Revelation 13, 15 through 18, uh, I'm going to read that Chapter 13, verses 15 through 18, uh, the Word of God says this, um, And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and also might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. And it also uh, and it causes all, both small and great, both poor and rich, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of that, the name of the beast or the number of its name. Now, this calls for wisdom that the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. And so, right there, we see that the number 666 is, is referring to a man. Um, and so, Mark of the Beast, it's identifying those who uh, are following and are worshiping the Antichrist. Um, That during the end times, uh, at some point, the Antichrist is going to rise up. He's going to deceive people. He's going to be allowed to do things that, that deceive multitudes of people. And they worship him. They are worshiping the Antichrist instead of Jesus. And so if you look in Revelation 13, there's the first beast and then the second beast. And so the first beast being the Antichrist, the second beast referring to the false prophet. Um, And as we read, that's the one who brings about this mark of that beast, a literal mark. Uh, some people speculate, you know, hey, could this be like this new fancy microchip that you get like in your in your wrist? Maybe, but we can only speculate about that. You can't say for sure. Um, the this, this text just does not give us that kind of information that, yes, it's going to be this or that. Um, we can only speculate. But at, at the end of the day, like we shouldn't be worried about it being like stuff that's here today. Like I am I do not believe this is my belief and understanding um, that the mark of the beast is out there today. Like, I I don't believe that. Why? Because I don't think we, we've really entered into this timeline yet. I think we're getting there. Um, But some things have to happen before, before we get to this point with the mark of the beast. Uh, And and you're not going to be like shocked and surprised. Like, Oh, that's, Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I got the mark. Oh, who? I didn't know that. Like it's not going to be something that you're going to get and then find out later on, oh, that was the mark of the beast. Like, it's going to be something that is, is clearly defined, um, that, that this is signifying someone who, who worships the Antichrist, um, and they're not going to let you, like the text says, buy or sell or do any of that without this mark. So it's going to be a clear, a clear marker, a clear separation. Um, and so... That, that's what it is, is really um, 
not a whole lot to like I, I know you want to know like what exactly is it going to be and you just need to not think about that like not not get bogged down in that I mean it is good to 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 grow your critical thinking and, and to study God's word um, but y'all there is a line like there is a point where it's like okay like I'm just I'm missing these main ideas that that the text does have for me and so don't like get caught up in all these super crazy like conspiracy theory kind of things like could it be this this or this like we're, we're, we want to study God's word but not get bogged down not get bogged down I hope that that makes sense um, so that is my understanding of the mark of the beast once again everything you're hearing in um, in this this series uh, these messages I've been doing this is my understanding of scripture. And so take that with a grain of salt with anybody you listen to, with anybody who comes and does your chapel or is at your church. Like you always want to, you know, OK, I believe you, but I'm going to read the Bible for myself. And you need to study God's word on your own, which has really been my goal for this whole series is to try to help you understand it on your own. So that's the mark of the beast. It's a mark that identifies those who following the Antichrist. Uh, the next question was, what is the difference between Hades' death and Satan in Revelation? We're going to do that question next week um, because I think that question deserves a lot more time than what I could give it today. And so we'll come back to that one next week. Uh, what happens to Christians on earth during the rapture? Christians on earth during the rapture. Uh, we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians. And so 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where... Um, we find this uh, idea uh, and the rapture and all that. First Thessalonians chapter four, verses thirteen through seventeen. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna read that. Uh, here you go. But we do not want you to be un. Stop. Stop right there. Pause. The subtitle in the ESV Bible, which is what I'm using, says the coming of the Lord. And so first off, whenever you're reading scripture, when you use this, don't like gloss over those subtitles to use those. Uh, this subtitle says the coming of the Lord. So that automatically gives me like an idea of the context. Like right? this is talking about the coming, second coming of Jesus. And so just wanted to insert that verse 13. Now we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as those who do not have hope for, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring those with him who have fallen asleep. For we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of, the archang of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That is where the, the rapture comes from. So the, the actual word rapture isn't found in the Bible. It's referring to what takes place here uh, in this passage. Um, so um, in verse, I think it is verse 17. Yes. Uh, verse 17, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Like that, that's the meat right there. Um, to be caught up literally means to be to be snatched up, to be snatched away, uh, is what the Greek word means for, for caught up. And so the rapture um, is coming from this idea that uh, when Jesus comes back at some point, right? So my understanding of scripture uh, is pre tribulation. And so that. Um, what happens there in First Thessalonians will take place before the tribulation. Um, that when he comes back, those who believe in Jesus will we're gone. We're up with him in the clouds. Uh, it's this point where Christians are are taken off, uh, taken away from earth. Uh, but the text says that the dead in Christ will rise first. And so, uh, my understanding of Scripture is that when a person, a believer, dies right now in today or whatever at this point in time. Their spirit goes to be with the Lord, but their physical body is here. There is a separation of soul and spirit. Um, but First Thessalonians shows us that 
uh, when we enter this timeline in the second coming of Jesus, that when, the, when this rapture takes place, those who have died in Christ, at that point, they're going to be reunited, physical body and spirit, and then be caught up with the Lord and then go, go up with Him. And so, uh, and then we, the, whoever's alive at that point, goes up to be with the Lord as well. And the text says we're with Him from that point forward. Now, now that, that's all the text says. There's, there's really no more really beneath that. Um, it, it's it's going to be a secret and obvious event at the same time. It's going to be a secret event that it's going to happen quick, and no one's really going to know until you know people start noticing, hey, there's like a couple million people missing in the world or whatever. Like that, that's going to be obvious. Um, you know, we got all these um, like movies and stuff like like Left Behind and good old Nicolas Cage and all that. Uh, Side note, I don't know what your feelings are on Nicolas Cage, but um, I'm not so sure he's like the best actor, but that's me, whatever, side note. Um, but like, so you have all those kinds of movies and stuff. Y'all, please, please don't base your theology off something Hollywood has put forward. I mean, please, 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 please. It doesn't even have to be like an end times kind of movie. It could be like a whatever, you know, Christian movie from Hollywood, like be cautious, just be cautious about basing your theology about like off of what you see on a movie. Like just be, be mindful of that. Um, we want to be basing our theology off of the study of God's word, uh, not off of what some person in Hollywood thinks it's, it's going to be like. Just be careful about that. Uh, I'm not so sure that the, those left behind movies and stuff is like the best representation of how this is going to go down, but you know who knows? They like to, to make movies, and so once again, to sum that back up, what's going to happen to Christians on Earth uh, during the Rapture? Um, boom, we go to be with the Lord. My understanding is that all Christians go up at that point to be with the Lord. Um, maybe I'm missing something. I mean, I could, I'm not this super wise old scholar by any means, but uh, my understanding is that Christians, we all go to be with them. Um, that there's not like a couple are taken and a couple are stay. That uh, my reading of the text says that those who, who believe, um, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them. Those who have passed away first uh, will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And, and I don't know, that's just what my understanding is. And so that is that. Moving on to the next one. Those were the three, Mark of the Beast, Hades, Death, and Satan, and then the Rapture were, were the three main ones. Uh, so Hades, Death, and Satan will come back to you next week, along with um, what does what's the best way to understand what God expects of me. I'm going to conclude with that one next week. Um, but what I want to do right now is just kind of uh, go back into some resources um, that you can use to take home with to, to help you grow in your understanding of God's Word. Uh, and that kind of thing. So uh, I have a couple of resources right here. I uh, hope you can kind of read this on this video. Um, gotquestions.org. Gotquestions.org is a wonderful resource. Um, really helpful. And, and un, you can just type in, you know, what is the mark of the beast or what is whatever. Uh, and, and they'll give you some articles. Now, pause. You got to be careful with anything you read on the internet. You got to be careful with any physical book you read. Just because it's printed in a book doesn't necessarily mean it's absolutely right. Like all these things we take with a grain of salt. Um, but I have used got questions a lot and I've, I have never seen anything on there that's crazy heretical. Um, but they have, they just have articles explaining different positions on this, this, and this and so on. And so uh, I like to use them. Uh, there's the gospelcoalition.org, the gospelcoalition.org. Um, I love them. I love the resources on there. Uh, you're going to have a, a good blend of different perspectives, um, uh, Protestant perspectives on there. But once again, uh, I've never seen anything heretical on there or crazy. Um, you know, these two, these two people are actually blew their Bible too. Those three are. Um, are within the guardrails of orthodoxy, so to speak. Uh, and so uh, I would recommend those to you, gotquestions.org, Gospel Coalition. So Got Questions and Gospel Coalition 
on those two websites, you're going to find like a bunch of articles, uh, Gospel Coalition, you'll find like essays and stuff from pastors and whatnot. And so that will help you kind of get like other perspectives of different things in the Bible. Blue Letter Bible is a great uh, online resource for, for Bible study. And so you can access commentaries. Uh, you can um, access different Bible translations, uh, Greek and Hebrew and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can get into that on Blue Letter Bible. It's a great, easy, free resource. Uh, they have an app. You, so if you like apps, get the Blue Letter Bible app. Um, that's fun to use. Uh, Haley's Bible Handbook. So if you go to Amazon, Haley's Bible Handbook on there, I think it's like 20 something bucks. Uh, it's really not horrible, um, but that's a great resource I would commend to you uh, to give you like a good overview of different books of the Bible. So it's like a commentary, but it's not like a super in-depth commentary. It's a, like an overview kind of commentary. And it's just such a great tool that I think any young person studying the Word of God should have because it, the way it's put together is just so good. And once again, for, to, from my understanding, it's within these guardrails of orthodoxy. So it's, it's good stuff. Um, and then finally, Seven Arrows Bible dot com. So I showed you the seven arrows Bible study method. And so if you want to learn more about that, um, there's a seven arrows Bible you can get. Um, there's a Bible study you can get. And also on that website, seven arrows Bible dot com. They are, <clears throat> there are videos from the guys that kind of put together this Bible study. They got videos explaining each arrow in more detail. And so they, I mean, probably a better job than I did. And so I would go to that website and check that out. Watch those videos. Um, they're super short and quick, um, but that's just a great tool to have. So got questions, Gospel Coalition, Blue Letter Bible, Haley's Bible Handbook, and Seven Errors Bible.com. Um, I mean, I use these resources frequently uh, throughout a week um, when it comes to prepping for, for youth and that kind of stuff. Um, but finally, l let me kind of bring all this back into to focus. Um, as we think about studying God's Word and, and studying Revelation especially, um, there are some principles of interpretation that we need to keep in mind. Because uh, Revelation I mean, it is a great book of the Bible. Uh, I mean, sometimes it feels like I'm reading like a J.J. Abrams kind of book, even though he makes movies. So, But like the movies are like super crazy, right? Anyways, bad analogies. Sometimes youth pastors have good analogies. Sometimes we don't, so whatever. Anyways, um, it's a really good book of the Bible to study and understand. Um, but there are some principles we need to keep in mind. So definitely the seven arrows stuff that I told you before. But also what I wanted you to, to think through today is, is this. And I totally need some more space on my whiteboard. I'm going to go over here. So I hope that the camera, yeah, the camera should see this, but my mic can't reach. Um, so, like, you have a personal Bible study, some sort of Bible study. So, like, when it comes to, to reading and understanding God's Word, you always, always, always start. You need to get your Bible. And by the way, I would say you need a physical Bible. Like, that's just my belief uh, and my perspective. I just think there's something unique about having a physical Bible in your hand, being able to like mark and highlight and write in. In my Bible, I have like a margin area that where I can take notes. Like that that's just, I don't know, it just changes the game when you're studying the Bible versus just scrolling on the Bible app. I mean, you can, and if that works for you, then do it. But I don't know, I just think it's, it's good to be able to, because like as you're reading, the stuff sticks out to you, you can, you can mark it right there. Uh, and then when you go back to read, you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. And so, but all that to say, um, you need to start with reading it for yourself. So you want to understand Revelation, fan stinkantastic. Go read the book yourself. Get your Bible, read through it, start there. Uh, and then from there, uh, as you study Scripture, you have church. What do I mean by that, John? Um, you read the Bible yourself, and you understand it in as you study in your personal time, and then you kind of zoom out to like your church, right? So church is a huge part of understanding God's Word. God has called and commanded pastors, people like me, by work with youth, right, to 
feed God's flock, to feed Christians the word of God. Um, he has structured that within the church, that there are people who he has called and commanded and gifted to help teach others the word of God. And so once you study the Bible, you want to understand it in light of your church. And so that could be like Sunday school. That could be a life group. That could be the Sunday morning sermon. Like your church is a set of guardrails on your understanding of Scripture, right? Now, obviously, this is assuming you are in a, a Bible-believing Orthodox church, right? The, no, it could be whatever denomination, right? I'm, I'm Baptist, that's me. But like, this is assuming that these, your church isn't like crazy, backwoods, snake handling, like, you know, crazy, whatever. <laughs> so that's very general and vague, but... I hope you understand what I'm getting at here, right? And so um, if you're like, if you want to know, you know, hey, is my church good or whatever, ask Mr. McKay. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be happy to tell you. <laughs> and so, but my point is you read the Bible in the context of your personal study. You read it in the context of, of your church. And then, and then you have like outside commentaries. Um, sorry, my handwriting is horrible. So then you, you zoom out even further to the opinions of other people who are, um, are outside of your relational zone, right? And so the people like in church, you know, ideally that, that's you're, you're in this area, you're, you're in a local church, you understand um, the word of God in that context. And then you uh, read commentaries like, like this kind of stuff uh, afterwards. Like that's kind of the... The funnel, ooh, that's a good word, funnel, you want to go through, except this one would be an upside-down funnel. Um, there you go. Pretend that's a funnel, but upside-down. So you start there, Bible study, then the church, and then outside commentaries as you study God's Word. Um, and that, by doing it this way, you are staying within good biblical guardrails for understanding the Word of God. Uh, verses, so verses... Um, if you just read Revelation yourself and like that was it, whatever came to your mind would be what you think is correct and what you think is true. That, my friends, is how heresies are born. Okay? Is when we just read the Word of God and we don't do it in light of church, we don't do it in light of a broader community. Um, like, there's a balance there, right? So, I mean, I do believe that the Holy Spirit does give us illumination and the Holy Spirit enables us to understand and interpret God's Word. I do believe that. But also, we cannot forget that God has given us these other brothers and sisters in Christ who are doing the same thing. And so, if I read God's Word, but... I come to a conclusion that is way different than 99% of other Christians. I think it's more likely that I did not come to the right conclusion versus these other 99% all missing the mark. And I just happen to be the one person that figured out the truth. Does that make sense? Like I had a buddy of mine. This is super recent. A good friend of mine went to, I went to college with who um, one day we were doing a Bible study and he was like, y'all, I don't believe in the Trinity anymore. Just just dropped that bomb on us. And like this dude, I thought was like, you know, okay, had his head screwed on straight. And he was like, yeah, I don't believe in the Trinity. And we were like, bro, where'd you get that from? And long story short, he got that conclusion because he was just reading, reading on his own and, and just missed it. He just, he just missed it for whatever reason. And that, that's one of the situations I'm talking about, like the, the Trinity, like that is a huge theological thing that it, it permits everybody is on. Like, like there's a super, 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 super small, you know, group of people who does not believe in the Trinity. Um, and so all that to say, when it comes to revelation, you want to start with the Bible study on your own and then do it in light of your church and then do it in light of all these other things. And so, all right, I think that's it for today. I know it was a lot, um, but man, revelation is just, it's so deep. 
And there's so much there, and 30 minutes isn't enough to <laughs> tell you all the ins and outs of everything. So, but I hope that um, these tools help you. Uh, and y'all remember, I'm just some dude from Marietta, not even from Marietta, I live in Marietta, uh, who works at a church. Like, I am not some crazy scholar dude who knows everything. Like, I, I hope that um, my study of scripture has helped you some and has given you some guidance. Uh, the awkward if it didn't. Um, but I hope that you've enjoyed it. And next week, we'll conclude with um, what is the difference between death, Sheol, and Hades. And Satan in Revelation and uh, how to know what God expects of me. And so I'm going to pray for us and then we'll be done. Um, but hey, if you do have any more questions, let Mr. McKay know and uh, we'd we'll love to maybe answer those some more. I'd um, we'll love to be a resource for you guys in any way I can. So uh, let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for today. Oh, God, I just pray for my friends at Walnut Grove Christian School, Lord, that you'd bless them. Um, God, that you would help them to understand God's word well. Uh, Lord, that you would uh, help them to be the men and women of God that you call them to be. Help them to pursue um, those good works in Ephesians 10, that it says, uh, 2 10, that it says, You've made for us. You, you've called us for a purpose. You've gifted us for a purpose, um, for a purpose to glorify you, to bring, um, to, to be an image bearer, Lord. And I just pray for all the students that you would help them during this time, give them grace and peace as we navigate all the COVID stuff. And uh, Lord, help us to not lose sight of the main things you've called us to. Um, we love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. See you later.